All right. Oh, I was dealing with cat issues. Make sure I mute that. Make sure that is going. Make sure I'm going on the YouTube. There used to be a button here I could press. Hello, I'm not sure if I'm here or not. So if you are here, why am I in preview mode? Back to live mode? Hello, I'm not sure if I'm here or not. Sorry, I think they I updated my software and they switched around the button, so. Um, I'm not sure if I'm actually live or not, so let me uh, check the YouTubes. But anyway, thank you for being here. This is just a... Uh, Another live stream, just as uh, informally asking questions. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. If you're here live, uh, let me know where you're coming in from and what you're studying. It looks like I'm here. Am I here? It looks like I'm live on the YouTube. Okay, sorry. I just, uh, I was dealing with cat issues again this morning. So I was kind of jumping around with that. So awesome, looks like we're going. Is this for Jet? Is it? Is this for, sorry, I'm having trouble with my buttons this morning. Is this for general questions? Yeah, just go, yeah, you can ask any. Um, let me turn my music off, I always forget about that. Um, go ahead and ask any questions and we'll just do a general Q&A. Sorry again, I was dealing with the cat this morning that he's, um, his schedule, his schedule has changed a little bit. He usually likes to um, be asleep right now, but now he uh, likes to run around, so. Hello, Jin Jin. Thanks for being here. Adam, thanks for being here. Thanks, everyone, for being here. So, again, this is just general Q&A. If you have any questions, go ahead and pop them in the chat. And we'll get to those. And anything else I can say, um... If you haven't heard, we're doing a little uh, New Year's giveaway, um... For a Lunar New Year coming up. Uh, so we have a few people who donated some products that were, uh, uh, given away. So if you want to enter, you can go to... Oh, it says, this isn't very exciting. I was going to show you the page and it doesn't show, it's like, because I've entered, I'm already in there. Uh, go to tcmstudy.net slash rabbit for the year of the rabbit, and there's a, we're doing a little giveaway of... Uh, it, it covered up the picture, so you can't see the picture. Um, uh, Evil Bone Water, which is like a, a high-quality version of Jungu Shui. Emily Skin Soothers, uh, th basically this guy, uh, I believe it started with his daughter, had some eczema and some skin problems, so he developed a line of soaps and uh, creams and lotions that would help with skin problems. So uses Chinese herbs, like some of the, st the stuff for a lot of redness, uses... Uh, Huang Bai and other heat clearing herbs and some dragon blood balm which is developed by rock climbers for their hands It's based on Ditta Jiao, but they made a balm form But because these are we're shipping physical products you have to be in the US um, I know a lot of people are bummed about that, but it's just that um, It turns out international shipping is very difficult and very expensive and they have a history of running into problems with I think with customs and imports uh, so so sorry, you have to be in the U.S. to win. All right. Jacqueline is here studying warm acid release the exterior herbs and UB points. So I'm, yeah, that makes sense. That would be um, herbs one and points two, because you start out with intro to herbs. They changed the herbs curriculum since I was a student. So yeah, that makes sense. That sounds like a third semester then. So awesome. How to prepare for biomedicine board exam. I got nothing for you. I don't know. I have no idea. The way I prepared for it is I, uh, I got the HB Kim book, uh, the, the big book, like now when I say HB Kim, a lot of, he has a, a small like clinic manual that you carry around in your pocket, but he also has a big book uh, that ha that is full of charts and things like that. So when I say the HB Kim, I mean the big book by HB Kim. And basically it's divided up into sections. I went to the section that said biomedicine and just kind of flipped through that and somehow I passed. Um, 
I was never very good at biomedicine. I don't like biomedicine. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I guess it's it's a two-part thing. I don't like biomedicine and I don't like boards. Sorry, I think my, my microphone is uh, not synced up with this camera. So when I switch cameras, there might be a, a slight delay here. So sorry if it's weird that my audio isn't synced up. Uh, I don't like biomedicine and I don't like board exams. I think board exams are dumb. Um, I think that it's a test that you have to pass and so you just have to suck it up and memorize the stuff for the test. But it's like, it, it's kind of like um, I've had to take tests for, a, for my motorcycle license in a couple different states and sometimes you take the test and it's like this test is not about do you know how to drive a motorcycle or do you know about motorcycle safety. It's a test about did you read the handbook and I feel like boards is the same way. It's did you read their books and so I would just go with the HB Kim book or at least that's what I did. I'll show you what I mean. I always have to search HB Kim because I never remember his website is acupuncturemedia.com. So if you go there, he does have some review courses. I think people like his review courses. Uh, but if you go uh, textbooks, he has a handbook and a mini book. I'm talking about the handbook, I believe. This is the bigger book. And it's just full of charts and stuff like that. So he has sections like that for biomedicine as well. So when I studied for biomed, that's what I used is his book and then there were like specific things that I knew I needed to know like which vitamins are fat soluble stuff like that so that would be my suggestion there other than that I don't know I'm also like this is gonna sound kind of mean but like when a lot of people ask me about like board board stuff board studying I'm also kind of like Hopefully you learn stuff during school. Like hopefully, like hopefully your teachers were good enough and and everything that you like actually learn things during school. So by the time you get to your board exam, you're just reviewing things. It's not like you're trying to learn four years of biomedicine in a month. So, um, so hopefully it's like you already have the foundation there, and it's just about flipping through and reviewing things. But I was never very good at it. Hi Nicholas, this is Balu from India. Hello Balu. Um, I want to know about plump chi and what is the cause for that and what is the pattern in TCM. So when we say plump chi, the Chinese term here is mai he chi, which means plump chi or plum stone chi. I think this is a Americanism versus a Britishism that in England, the the thing in the center of your fruit is a stone. Like if you eat a date, the seed in the center is called a stone. In America, we call it a pit. So either plum pit chi or plum stone chi. This is a feeling of something that is stuck in the throat that cannot be swallowed nor ejected. A lot of times we say it's like a piece of raw meat stuck in the throat. And this is an example of insubstantial phlegm. So if you remember when we talk about phlegm, we say there's substantial phlegm, like sputum that you cough out, and then you have insubstantial phlegm, which is phlegm that you can't see. Some people, some people have argued with, with me about this, that basically my Chinese teacher told me that insubstantial phlegms includes things like nodules on the skin, groiter scrofula. That would be an example of insubstantial phlegm because if you got out a scalpel, if somebody had a lipoma and you cut it open, you would not see sputum. That's insubstantial phlegm blocking the channels causing nodules. We can also have insubstantial phlegm misting the heart orifices causing shen problems. Again, if you did an autopsy on this person and cut them open and dissected their heart, you would not see sputum, literal sputum or snot in their heart. That's insubstantial phlegm in the heart. Um, we can talk about insubstantial phlegm in terms of um, Infertility issues, you can have insubstantial phlegm in the lower jaw or blocking the channels that go to the uterus and things like that. So that's a pattern for infertility. Again, you would not actually see literal sputum there. Uh, or another one is this plum pit chi is usually considered insubstantial phlegm. And this is a type of phlegm that we would usually say it's due to an emotional cause. That is some emotional stress might stagnate the liver chi. When the liver chi stagnates, then the, the fluids will stagnate and they can congeal into phlegm. And so we get this insubstantial phlegm. The interesting thing about insubstantial phlegm though is even though you can't physically see the sputum, it will still be reflected the same in the tongue and the pulse. So even if you have insubstantial phlegm, you'll still have a slippery 
uh, polyps, you'll still have a tongue with a thick coating. So we do still see those signs of phlegm in the tongue and the pulse. It's just that you're not actually coughing up gunk out of your lungs. So that's what we mean by insubstantial phlegm. And so there are actually, I believe technically, if you look up my hood chi, there are like two or three different patterns. I think the most common is liver chi stagnation. So that's why I always say liver chi stagnation, but there are actually, uh, there are two or three other patterns and I can't remember them off the top of my head right now. I would have to go look in, in um, Bensky to be sure. So um, if you have the formulas and strategies book, the green Bensky, and you go look up Ban Xia Hu Pu Tong in the commentary, we'll talk about there are different patterns of plum pit chi. But generally we say it's due to some emotional upset, upset when the liver chi stagnates and the fluid, chi, fluid stagnate, and that causes this insubstantial phlegm stuck in the throat. Sometimes people make this analogy like, Suppose you get some bad news or you have something that we, we use the, a figure of speech that's difficult to swallow, like, oh, that's a, that's a lot to take in, that's difficult to swallow. That's the kind of emotional upset that would stagnate your chi and make it like it's figuratively difficult to swallow. Or um, some people think of like, like an emotional response where they feel choked up that can manifest as chi stagnation around the throat and they can't swallow. And so the major formula we use for this is called Ban Xia Hu Pu Tang. Oh, it came up in my suggested in here. No, that's a different, that's a different website. Ban Xia Hu Pu Tang. Sorry, I'm trying to show it to you using the internet rather than trying to look up my notes. So Ban Xia Hu Pu Tang. Um, so we can see, of, of course, the main herbs are Ban Cha and Hu Pu. So Ban Cha is our main uh, herb for transforming phlegm, but it transforms substantial phlegm, like stuff that you cough out or phlegm that you would vomit up. But it also transforms insubstantial phlegm in terms of phlegm nodules and also plum pit chi. And then um, sub Zutsu Ye to regulate the chi and things like that. So this is, we say, liver chi stagnation, phlegm and stagnant chi blocked plum pit chi. So the, this is the formula that we'd use for it. So again, the, or chi stasis with chi state. I don't think chi stasis is a real thing. I think he, I think he's, he probably means chi constraint. And I think that might be a mistranslation of the word e. Um, so chi constraint with, or depressed chi is what a wise man would say, depressed chi with phlegm retention. Um, a feeling of suction in the throat as if a slice of roast meat were stuck there and cannot be coughed up nor swallowed down. Yeah, this sensation becomes more prominent during emotional upset and subsides when relaxed. And then we see other things like distension and pain in the sides and flanks. This is liver chi stagnation, hypochondriac pain, liver chi stagnation, melancholy and depression, tendency to sigh, so all liver chi things. Globus hystericus is the... Um, the Western scientific name for that, which sounds kind of weird, the hystericus, you're, they think you're hysterical because there's not anything actually there. Does he have any notes? No. So this is, I feel like this is the most common pattern for plum pit chi and that's the formula we use. Like I said, there, are, there actually are a couple different patterns. I want to say like kidney yin deficiency. There are some deficiency patterns there too. I just can't remember them off the top of my head. And honestly, I don't remember if there are formulas specifically to treat them just because we always talk about Ban Sha Ho Po Tong. So that's something I remember reading, but I would have to go back and look it up if, you, if we wanted to be sure about it. So hopefully that was helpful with... Um, Plum pit chi. Is dry skin always associated with blood and yin deficiency? Mm. I'd have to think about that. That would have to be something we would ask a dermatologist, like a mason dermatologist. I'm tempted to say no, that it could be excess heat drying out the skin, but but it's kind of like if it's dry, that means there it's not getting there's not fluids there, there's not enough nourishment of fluid. So I would say like you do have to go a little bit deeper about what's causing it. I guess this also depends: are we technically talking about just dry skin, or are we talking about rash? Because we can have like rash due to wind, and I guess that like that would seem like dry and itchy. But I'm not sure if if people like if you ask someone like. 
is it a rash or is it dry skin? I don't know if they would know the difference. So I would, yeah, so I'd generally say there's not enough yin and blood nourishing the skin, but it, there could be other things like wind or heat or things like that. Uh, what is the difference between plum pit chi and piglet chi? What is the cause and what is the normal treatment plan? So yeah, so here we're getting into plum pit chi is my he chi, uh, running piglet chi is bentun bing. Bing means disease, uh, bentun. Um, and that was, I think that was first described by uh, ZZJ, by Zhong Zhong Jing in the Jingwe Yao Wei. And that was like a, uh, so Ben Tun is like a feeling of stuff rushing up into the heart. And so he says it's like a piglet, the chi is running, the chi from the kidney is running up towards the heart and it feels like a piglet running upward. I think in modern terms, we basically think that he was describing a panic attack. So, so we would say that both of these are emotional issues. One is more about chi constraint causing insubstantial phlegm in the throat. So we'd use that stuff to transform phlegm. Whereas uh, running piglet chi, again, there are a couple different patterns for running piglet chi. So you'd probably want to go look up in a book um, how to differentiate all the different patterns. But it's a sensation of chi rushing up into the heart. So we can think about... Um, I was gonna say Gan Mai Da Zao Tang, but I think we really say that's more for Zhang Zhao, which is restless organs, which is maybe not entirely the same thing. So, um, or like Tian Wang Gu Xin Dan or things like that. So this this is again like, if we wanted a full complete answer, I would want to go and and look things up to make sure I'm not saying anything dumb or incorrect. But um, one is called Mai He Chi Plum Pit Chi, and one is called Ben Tun. Um, and there, there is a formula called Bentun Tong. What does that one look like? I don't remember that one off the top of my head. Uh, so let's look at this. So if we look up Bentun Tong, musings on Bentun Tong. That sounds very Chinese. Musings on Bentun Tong. Uh, so this is a translation about, um, yeah, the golden cabinet. Uh, so that's the Jingwei Yalue. And it gives this formula. Gan Sao, Ban, again, Ban Shao, Sheng Jiang Gu again. This, is, this formula treats Ben Tun Chi with surging into the chest. I don't know if you can read that. With surging into the chest and spleen, uh, when yang collapses and the spleen is vanquished, this causes sinking and construction of liver wood and wood infusion. I'm gonna, yeah. So basically, if you want to learn learn more about this, uh, look up Ben Tun, running piglet and depression. So there's stuff you can look up here. Uh, ben Tun Tong running piglet decoction. So again, there are a couple different patterns here, so you can look up the different patterns. Sorry, this is one of those things where it's like I, I've i never, like, treated a whole lot of this. And um, so I can't, I, if I if I wanted to say the very defini definitive things, I would want to research it a little bit first to make sure that I wasn't misspeaking and giving you incorrect information. So, sorry, just off the top of my head, those are the things that are coming up. So maybe we can do a video about that where I actually go look up the patterns and make sure I'm saying something Um, abdominal, does this get bigger? I feel like this is... No, that just makes it smaller. I, I can't, I can't turn it into, uh, oh, 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 I made, oh, I did, I made it so much worse. Abdominal distension, hypochondriac, chest depression, what chatter, patterns they are mostly related to. Um, so abdominal distension, distension means like it's bulging out. So abdominal distension, think about like you ate too much food and now your pants feel really tight. It's like, it's, it's, uh, I feel like there used to be a, a commercial for Pepto-Bismol about that where people are, oh, I feel so bloated and distended. So bloated would be another word for that. Um, chest oppression sounds really weird. That's a, that's a term that we use. 
I feel like that's like inability to expand the, the chest. I think like a severe form of that when like someone is having a heart attack, it feels like there's an elephant sitting on their chest. That would be a severe form, but uh, in a less severe form, we might have difficulty expanding a chest. Hypochondriac pain or hypochondriac distension or oppression. We're talking kind of about the rib sides. I actually don't know if there's a difference between the hypochondria and the flanks and the rib sides. Different people will use different words, and I don't know. I actually don't know if those are different things. I just assume that it means this area. And I'm, I'm also operating under the assumption that a patient will never come in to, and say, oh, I have hypochondriac distension. Nobody actually says that. What, they, what you really see this as is... Uh, difficulty taking a deep breath is they have difficulty expanding the chest or difficulty expanding the ribs or they have frequent sighing when they're like <sighs> that means there's chi stuck in this area and they have to sigh a lot in order to get that chi to move so um, common patterns we're gonna see is it really depends when we talk about abdominal distension we can we can basically mean anything stagnating in the liver or spleen stomach um, so we could have cold, I mean, anything stagnating, phlegm, even if we have phlegm in the chest or phlegm in the abdomen, I think, depending on whether you're specifically saying distension or oppression. Um, but generally, when we take, say, like, hypochondriac and chest oppression, I would think that, like, the liver chi is not moving or there's something going on with the liver channel. But we can also see that sometimes the liver attacks horizontally into the middle jowl, and um, you can also get abdominal distension, so... Uh, so basically, those are very vague and very wide, and there are a lot of different things that can cause those. But if we're talking about the chest and hypochondria, I would my first inclination would be to go to like liver chi stagnation. If we're talking about um, abdominal distension, my first thought would be something in in the middle jowl, chi stagnation, chi deficiency, things not moving. Um, boop boop ba doo. So. I'm just thinking about like all the formulas I went through and like half of them have like some sort of chest depression or abdominal distension or things like that. So it's it's kind of like you would you would want to look at what else is going on there. You can you would you would look for other signs and symptoms to pare it down. So Hi Lily, thanks for coming in from India. Glad you like the videos. Okay, in five elements concepts, if fire is too strong, we reduce it by tonifying water along the Kuh cycle. If we tonify water, won't that make wood stronger? And yeah, so I think this is saying that like things are flowing downstream. And so it's kind of like... The controlling point or the grandmother point is two steps back along the Sheng cycle. So on the one hand, it's controlling it. But yeah, you can make this argument that like if you if you tonify water, that will go downstream and tonify wood, which will then go downstream and tonify fire. And this is just one of those things where like when you talk about the, the circles of the Sheng and the Ke cycle, you can eventually get to the point where anything does anything. So it's like, oh, if I wanted to tonify fire, well, couldn't I, if I tonified metal, then metal would strengthen water, and then water would strengthen wood, and then wood would strengthen fire. So by tonifying metal, I'm tonifying fire. It's like you could eventually go through all of those steps and probably make that work. Um, I think I would just think, think about keeping it simple and then also think about... Um, when you're getting into the stuff, this is like, like we kind of said with Zach, uh, Zachary Louis, that this is like an energetic medicine. And so think about like, what is your intention here? That we're, that the kind of the energy relationship is what matters as well. Like, um, so think about when you tonify water, you're doing it with the intention of putting out the fire. You're not doing it with the intention of, I'm going to tonify water so that wood can grow and then wood can further supplement fire. That just... Because if you, if you start getting into that, everything does everything. So that's what I would think about is, well, kind of, even though it sounds kind of dumb and corny, think about what is your intention when you're needling that point.
Consistent ache in the left kidney for years with heat in the face, head and body gets worse with any exercise. Um, that sounds very specific. I would, I would go see an acupuncturist. I'm not, I'm not sure I can diagnose that over a, um, in, in this format. So, um, also if it's like, if it's like a physical like this, this is things where I like think about red flags about, we want to make sure that there's nothing, nothing serious going on in terms of, um, stuff, stuff with the kidneys. So if, if you're like my literal kidney hurts, it's, that might be like, first get that checked out with the doctor. Studying in diploma right now. Should I go to China and get some certification about acupuncture later? Um. So I'm. I guess I'm not sure when you're, where you are right now. I'm. I'm. I'm assuming you're in India right now. I'm not sure if it's if it's if I should make that assumption. Um. Or or what kind of diploma you're getting. Um. I don't know, because um, because this is like I'm I'm gonna give you a very American answer, which is nobody fucking cares. Um, my eyes, sorry, I think I got cat hair. Um, my thoughts on that, because sometimes it like to give you to give you the American example, some people would say. Um, would ask about this is in in America we start out with a what we call a master's degree and then you can do some extra do an extra two semesters and get a doctorate degree and so the doctorate degree is considered more prestigious or higher level than the master's degree even if you're not learning a lot of new inf uh, new information that having the title of doctor is much more prestigious in America than just saying a, a licensed acupuncturist and so people will say should I go get the doctorate. And I think the honest answer is nobody nobody cares. And this, this and there may be a cultural difference depending on where you are, but I think at least from an American's perspective, nobody cares. People care about if you get results. If you get results, if you make them feel better, they will go tell their friends and their friends will come to see you. They don't care whether you call themselves. But that might also be in America. I think sometimes people have a fear of doctors as well. So, like, they... Maybe it's not necessarily as prestigious. I don't know. Um, so I don't. So I don't know if that's something that applies to like culturally where you are. If you say, "Oh, I st I studied under this great master in China," maybe that does give you uh, more trust or more clout or more respect. So from a cultural perspective, perspective, I don't know. For, but at least in America, I always like to say, if you get results, nobody cares. That's the main thing. Um, but it also, I think it's, it would be a good idea to go to China just because they're very good at Chinese medicine. So I, if you had the opportunity to go to China, I would, I would think you could, you could learn a lot and get a lot of good skills. So that's what I would think about there. Oh, so, um, yeah, sorry. I feel like I've kind of dropped the ball. Like we had some really good questions on, uh, my Hu Chi and Ben Tun Bing, and I feel like I kind of dropped the ball on that. Those are ones that I would go back and uh, look up to get the full diagnosis, to get the full uh, pattern differentiation on that. So, see if we have anything else here. Um, some questions from the comments. Not that one. So this is a this is a question from uh, that was on, um, I guess it was last it was last week's Q and A. We were talking about liver on, liver yang rising. So, uh, liver two is a yin spring point, and yin spring points treat empty heat conditions. Well, if you look at Deadman, liver two is used to treat liver and, liver fire and liver wind. Liver three is similar to point functions, but liver three tonifies because it's a yuan source point. Tonifying liver blood would treat liver yang rising by treating the root, but liver two could also be used uh, yang spring point function. So basically, the question here is like, if we have this, if we have liver heat or liver yang rising, um, what's the difference between liver two and liver three? 
So I guess I would say, first of all, when we say here that liver two is a ying spring point and ying spring points treat empty heat conditions, that is something, basically that is a point of view that we see in the Wang Juyi book, Applied Channel Theory, and I believe Wang Juyi, I think he's correct, but that's not necessarily something that comes up in Deadman, and that's not something... Basically, I've never seen any anything classical to back that up. When we when you look at the Nanjing, when we talk about the five shoe transport points, the Nanjing simply says, through the spring points, one can master body heat. So it doesn't uh, differentiate between excess heat and deficiency heat. Nanjing just says you can treat heat, and that's kind of what we see when Deadman explains his points is that we're just treating heat, and then Deadman also just pulls in from. Uh, a variety of sources, uh, like point prescriptions and things like that, he, he pulls in from a variety of, of sources. And so I think historically people have used ying spring points beyond just empty heat that we just say ying spring points in general treat heat. So so even though Wang Juyi makes that differentiation between spring points treating empty heat, I'm not sure that I haven't seen anybody else make that differentiation. So that, that's one of the things to look at when he, when Deadman says liver two can treat excess heat, excess fire, and things like that. I think that's very common for um, ying spring points. And that's not just something he's like pulling out of his ass that he actually um, went through and looked at and found point prescriptions where liver two is being used in this way. Um, so I so I also trust uh, Deadman and Mason Alkafaji's uh, judgment on that. But in terms of liver two versus liver three, I think this is an interesting question. And so basically I would think about if there's more heat, whether it's excess or deficient, but if we're seeing a lot of heat, like a lot of movement, red face, red eyes, uh, a lot of heat signs, then I might be more inclined to go to the spring points and think about like maybe pair it with pericardium, pericardium eight. I'm, I was like, heart and pericardium, pericardium eight. Um, so you're doing the, the fire points on the Jue Yin channel could be a very good way to clear heat and using a point pair like that. Liver three, I would use, um, basically, I think there are some people who are okay using both points. I think it's kind of weird to use two points that are right next to each other, but I know that other people do it. I just, to me, it seems kind of weird. Um, but liver three, I like to use a lot when I want to anchor things downward as well. So when we talk about needling liver three, you insert the needle into liver three and it says to aim towards kidney one on the bottom of the foot. <clears throat> and so sometimes I like to use, like, use that method when basically I want to needle kidney one, but I don't want to needle kidney one because I'm afraid the patient's not going to like it. Or if I have a lot of upward movement in the liver channel and I want to anchor it back down, then I'm using a liver point, but I'm kind of connecting it through to kidney one and that anchors things back down. So I would think about like kidney one is on the bottom of the foot. So stimulating a point on the bottom of the foot will pull things downward. So if I go through liver three and then think about at least mentally connecting to kidney one, then it's kind of like I'm accessing the functions of both at the same time and pulling that liver energy downward. So it kind of depends on if it's more about like stuff raising upwards, like a lot of times if the person has liver chi stagnation, when the chi gets stuck, it will it will start ascending upwards, but you may not see a lot of signs of heat. Um, then, or or if you had a lot of deficiency and things were going up because they were not being rooted, then maybe maybe use that because you're you're tonifying and bringing things downward. But if it's just like clear heat signs, then yeah, maybe go to liver two pericardium eight. Um, Jacqueline says, can you talk about liver chi stagnation? Uh, give me more there. Like, is there anything specifically you want to know about liver chi stagnation? Uh, otherwise, we could just go on for a while about liver chi stagnation. Um, uh. What is your take on how to sell formula with animal ingredients? How do you disclose? Um, I'm, I'm usually just like, this has animal parts in it um, and see if they're okay with that. Um, I'm trying to think of like specific examples of when this has come up. I feel like I can, I can go up more. 
because I'm slouching a lot and I'm, I'm slouching out of frame. Um, because I do remember the story of uh, somebody practicing in Utah and they gave him a formula, Swan Zaren, and this person uh, went home and took the formula and they saw the Swan Zaren and they thought ground up, they thought it looked like coffee and uh, due to their religious beliefs, they did not drink coffee. So they were very upset, like, how could you give me something with coffee in it? And he had to be like, no, no, you're you're mistaken. It's actually Swanza Ren. So that was the that was one of the first things that came to mind is we not only have to deal with think about animal parts, but the ingredients in general and and explaining about what's in there. Um. Yeah, I guess usually I'd just say like when we talk about the the formula and how to take it, I'd just be like, oh, by the way, this has. Thinking about what animal parts I've given. Because I guess with like, lo like Longu and Muli, I usually don't worry about uh, unless I know the person is like very strictly vegan. But like when I think about like oyster shell, I think like that's, I guess that's technically an animal part, but I'm not sure if the oysters had to die to do it. So usually when I give animal parts, it's going to be like um, e jiao, donkey gelatin, or lu rong occasionally I've given. I'm trying to think of what else. Have I given people things with geckos? I've made alcohol with geckos, but it's but that's kind of like something I made for myself. Like I've given that to people, but it hasn't really been in a, a practice practitioner setting. It's been more like, hey, I made this I made this vodka with geckos in it. Do you want to try some? Um, what other animals? I feel like most people are more weirded out by insects. Again, this might just be an American thing, but we have some, like, giving people formulas with chan tue or, like, cicada skins. And so I think some of the, or a di long uh, earthworm. I've given people um, bu yan huang wu tong and things like that, like post-stroke conditions where it has earthworm in it. Um... So it, it's usually like when you give a formula, you like you have to explain why you're giving it to them. You, I usually don't just say, here, here's a bottle of pills, take these, get out of here. It's usually you would say, you would explain like people will ask, what are they and what are they doing? I'd be like, oh, these are um, uh, basically we were saying like, oh, you, you have this problem. There's wind in the channels. We're trying to extinguish, extinguish the wind or something like that. But in the process of explaining what the formula is for and how to take it, I would bring up in there sometime like, by the way, just in case this is something that you're not comfortable with, this does contain earthworms. So I just want to check and make sure that um, if you're vegan or vegetarian or you have some objection to that, I want to make sure you're aware of that before we start taking it. So just something like that. And I would say, by and large, people are like, I don't care. If it makes me feel better, I'll take it. I'll bathe in cicada skins if it makes this itching stop. So by and large, most people don't care. Um, but it's something that you can mention. That there's, they might say, no, I'm vegetarian. Is there, all, is there an alternative? And then you can say yes. So I feel like it's not... It's not, it's not that difficult to bring up. And so I guess usually I would disclose it when we're talking about the formula. What, what is the good formula good for and how do you take it? And then in there bring up like, by the way, this has, this has donkey gelatin in it. Are you okay taking gelatin? Stuff like that. Um... Oh, would you make a point review video about the bladder channel with model, especially for back shoe? Um, I've been avoiding that for a while. Just the bladder, the UB meridian is so long. It's so annoying. Um, but basically right now I'm, I'm kind of taking a break from acupuncture and focusing on herb stuff. So a lot of the videos that are going to be coming out are, are going to be about herbs. I'm re-recording the videos for the herb review course, for the paid course, and so then I'm going to do some videos along with that. But basically right now I'm going to focus on herbs for probably the next month or two, and then I'll probably get back into acupuncture videos. And I think my plan there is uh, just go through the channel straight through in order, but I might might re-record the stomach and large intestine videos because those are the stomach and large intestine are like some of the first videos I recorded and they're super awkward. So I'm going to re-record those and then just go through those. In terms of the actual point location videos, I'm kind of still on the fence about whether or not I want to do that. Um, I know that a lot of people find those helpful, 
but those the specifically the the point location with the model those were videos I made during COVID when um, the campuses were closed, and so basically I I had a colleague come to me and they're like hey, do you have any videos on point location because we don't we don't know how to teach point location over Zoom the campus is closing all of our classes are going online, like we don't know how to how to lo teach stomach channel point location over Zoom. Um, so, so that's, that's why I started making those videos, but it's, it's kind of like you should be learning point location in person. So, so I feel kind of weird about this. On the one hand, people really like those videos because they're a good review and it breaks them down okay-ishly well. I'll be honest, my point location on those videos is not super great just because like there's a camera in front of me and I'm like wrapping my arms around a tripod and a camera. So like I've even gotten comments about that work. Like my line is crooked and I have to go back and fix it. And it's like, yeah, that's because the model is over here and I'm, I'm locating my points like this. And so there's a parallax error. So I can't actually see where I'm locating. So the, the location on those videos isn't always great. Um, I know it's a good review, but I also think that you should be learning point location in person. And I also worry about non-acupuncturists watching those videos and thinking they can stick needles in people. So, um, that, that's, that's kind of, I'm hesitant to make more of those videos. I'm, I'm actually kind of worried about the fact that those videos are on YouTube, that if people who, um, Basically, you shouldn't learn acupuncture by watching the video. You should ac learn an acupuncture. You should learn acupuncture from an actual person. So I'm I'm kind of worried that people are going to watch those and be like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy some needles on Amazon and stick needles in myself or stick needles in my friend, and that's really bad. Don't do that. But anyway, the short answer there is eventually I'll get back to the acupuncture videos. I'm going to focus on herb videos first, just because I like herbs more. I think people have more trouble with herbs than they do with acupuncture. If you're going through a program, you get like four years of acupuncture and you'll eventually get, you'll eventually figure it out. Um, whereas herbs, er, er, people have a lot more trouble with herbs. You don't get as much practice with herbs in the clinic. Whereas like if you were doing acupuncture, if you go through, if you're a, an assistant and then an intern for, for a year or two, you'll get a lot of practice locating points and doing your needling and there. There will be someone there to correct you when just a lot of people don't understand herbs and you don't actually get a lot of herbal practice in the clinic. So that's why I like to focus on herbs. Um, um, yeah, so so there's so over the, at least for the next couple months, possibly the next semester, I'm going to be focusing on herbs, and then I'll get back into the acupuncture. Uh, here, so here, this is an interesting thing about coffee. I always thought this would be a fun thing to do is to try to break down um, like the taste, temperature, and properties of coffee. So we're we're, we're here where we're saying the. Um, the bitter taste uh, clears heat and dries dampness, but why does coffee uh, boop, 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 lost it. why does coffee raise high blood pressure and presumably cause heat signs? So yeah, I think this is a good question. Uh, besides the high blood pressure, I think um, we could infer that uh, coffee is um, so maybe we'll break it down this way. If I were to break down uh, the the properties of coffee, I would say that. Oh, number one, coffee is bitter in flavor. I think you can taste it and you can tell that it's bitter, but we can also kind of infer that from some of its actions um, in terms of moving things downward and drying dampness. So we'd say that coffee is bitter in flavor. I'd also say that coffee is acrid in flavor. I'm not sure if I, if you can necessarily taste the acridity or the spiciness, but I think in terms of Coffee also has this function of movement. It moves things through the middle jowl. Um, at least uh, in Europe, coffee was uh, served after a meal as a digestive. That was the word I was trying to think of. That when you eat something before a meal to uh, like wet your appetite or promote your appetite, that's called an aperitif, like an appetizer. Whereas something that was taken after the meal is a digestive that helps you um, digest things. So that could be like coffee, usually like in a demi tasse, like a shot of espresso coffee or um, certain strong alcohols or things like that. So 
Traditionally, coffee was meant uh, to help aid digestion, as in it moved things through. And so that's why I would say it's acrid in flavor, because it has this effect of uh, regulating chi in the middle jowl, moving middle jowl chi, or we could even say reducing food stagnation, because besides the historical context, this is a thing where it's like, if I eat a bunch of pancakes and uh, I feel abdominal distension, we were talking about ado abdominal distension before, if I eat a bunch of pancakes and a lot of sweet, sticky stuff and I feel um, uh, some abdominal distension, like the food is stuck, usually drinking coffee will help alleviate that. So we could say that, like, I ate so much I got food stagnation, whereas the coffee, its bitter flavor is moving things downward so that things are moving downward into the small intestine, but also it ha its acrid flavor is helping things move. So that's why I would argue that it also has an acrid flavor. But it's definitely warm in temperature is the thing. And so I think besides like hypertension, what we talked about is we can see other signs of heat. Um, one of the things you'll see is, uh, it's very common for people who drink a lot of coffee, they'll feel it will affect their heart. So I would say coffee, um, it enters the stomach channel because it moves things, but it's heat, it can cause stomach heat. So overconsumption of coffee could cause stomach heat and that heat can very easily go into the heart. So sometimes people... I've known people that if they drink coffee, they say, if I just drink, drink black coffee, it upsets my stomach or like gives them like a stomach ulcer. They get stomach pain. Or if they have a history of ulcers, it exacerbates that, that type of feeling. So I'd say that uh, coffee creates stomach heat. Uh, we can also see that I'm just thinking like I, one of my friends was a very earthy person. And so whenever he would drink coffee, he would like talk faster and you would actually start to sing more. And so that was a sign of stomach heat. It can also affect your breath. That's a sign of stomach heat. So I think um, coffee, even though it's bitter in flavor, it does create stomach heat. And then what can also happen is that stomach heat can go into the heart. So some people, they drink a lot of coffee and they can feel, they get palpitations. They can feel their heart beat faster, sometimes to the point where they start getting anxiety. And so this is something I've seen when uh, people come in and they have anxiety or panic attacks. One of the things I ask about is like, do you drink coffee? And I've seen that work with people that if they cut out coffee, they notice a reduction in their anxiety and they notice a reduction in the frequency of their panic attacks. And sometimes it's very small amount. Sometimes they'll just be like, I drink coffee like twice a week, but cutting that out uh, had an effect on their symptoms. So I'd say that that's stomach heat going into the heart, causing heart heat, causing things like palpitations or um, panic attacks. I would also say that sometimes when we uh, talk about herbs, we talk about this pattern of heart heat pouring into the small intestine. And so this is something that we talk about with things like mutong or dan juye. So if, you, um, if you're in herbs one, we learn dan juye in the um, drain fire category. It clears heart for heart heat pouring into the small intestine, a uh, bland bamboo leaf. Yeah, I was going to say Dan Juye and Deng Xin Sao are, are right next to each other. I was hoping I didn't get them confused. Dan Juye and then in the drain dampness, I think we learned Mutong. When you get to formulas, we have a formula called Dao Chur San, guide out the red powder. That's specifically for heart heat, or you can say heart heat pouring into the small intestine. So when you say heart heat pouring into the small intestine, kind of like... Basically, it ends up, you get heart heat that ends up with urination problems. So the idea is the heart is paired with a small intestine. The small intestine is paired with the bladder through its tai yang relationship. So basically, if you have heat in the heart, that heat can pour over into the small intestine and will end up with urination problems. I think I explained this out of order. But basically, what, what happens there with heart heat pouring in the small intestines, we're going to see three types of things. Number one is shen disturbance, so either something physical like palpitations, but also shen disturbance as in anxiety, insomnia, um, irritability, things like that. We can also see sores on the tongue because the heart sprouts in the tongue. So if there's a lot of heart heat, that heat can burn the tongue and cause sores. And then we can also see urination problems due to heart heat pouring into the small intestine. So like a reddish, scanty, difficult, or even burning urination. Those could all be signs of heart heat pouring into the small intestine. And I would always kind of say that if you want to experience heart heat pouring into the small intestine, the way you can do that is drink a lot of coffee. At least I've had this happen to me that 
where I started like really drinking a lot of coffee, like several cups per day, I started having these symptoms that when you drink a lot of coffee, sometimes you can feel like your heart starts pounding. You start to feel like you have palpitations. And of course, like you can't sleep. If you drink a lot of coffee, you're going to have insomnia. And so that's like a shen disturbance of that heat getting into the heart. But actually, I, I also like, I was at a point where I was drinking so much that like I did get sores on my tongue and mouth, which I thought was really interesting. And it did affect my urine. Like, like usually like when you drink coffee, like you can smell it in your pee, that's normal. But I was drinking so much that I did start to get dark urine instead of like being clear when you drink a lot of water or yellowish, it was like dark and starting to turn reddish. And I was like, oh my God, I'm giving myself heart heat pouring into the small intestine. And I thought it was really cool. But anyway, I would say that's the effects of coffee. And back, kind of back to the original question, um, about the bitter flavor. It's kind of like there are bitter herbs that clear heat, but not all bitter herbs clear heat. It is possible to have bitter herbs that are warm in temperature. So for example, Chen Pi, I think is, it's bitter in flavor because it dries dampness, it has a downward direction, but it's warm in flavor. We don't use Chen Pi to clear heat. So it's kind of like the bitter flavor can clear heat, but it's not like every bitter thing clears heat. You can have that, you can have bitter warm things and bitter hot things. And then a lot of times when you have that, it's just that the bitter flavor also dries dampness. So Chen Pi is warm in temperature, but it also um, dries dampness and deals with thin phlegm. Uh, but also the bitter flavor has a downward direction. And so sometimes when we say something is bitter, we're referencing it to the fact that it moves things downward. like. Xing Ren apricot seed is from the stop cough and wheeze category. It's actually neutral in temperature. You don't really use Xing Ren to clear heat, but it's bitter in flavor because it goes downward to treat rebellious lung qi. So I guess, I guess that's kind of the, the real answer to your question is just because a herb is bitter, it doesn't necessarily mean that it clears heat. Sometimes it, it's bitter. It just means that it dries dampness, which I would say that coffee does dry you out. Um, that's a thing where like coffee can cause constant, like sometimes drinking a little bit of coffee can promote movement through the large intestine. And again, I think that's because it's a bitterness and acridness that it can create that movement. But sometimes if you drink too much coffee, it will dry you out. And I think that it's, that's the bitterness drying you out. So sometimes if you drink too much coffee, it can actually cause constipation because you're drying out the fluid. So I would say coffee is bitter as in it dries things out and it moves downward it doesn't actually have an action of clearing heat. And we can find other examples in the Materia Medica of bitter herbs that um, clear heat. Dandelion leaf and root as a coffee substitute. Is there a name for that? I feel like, yeah, I feel, I feel like, like there are, there are a lot of like coffee substitutes and I know a lot of people do like mushroom stuff as a coffee substitute. I feel like, not chaga, I feel like there's another thing that it's like a root and people, a chicory root? Is chicory root something different? I don't know much about about English, English names of things. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Because dandelion is pugonging and it's, uh, it's uh, good for clearing heat. I believe. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, honestly, for a coffee, if you if you don't like coffee, I would just like drink tea. Um, I feel like like tea is a little bit more moderate, depending on what kind of tea you drink. Um, but I think tea is still going to be bitter. Um, but its temperature is going to depend on what kind of tea you're drinking. So green tea is going to be more cool in temperature, whereas, um, you have to be careful here. Black tea is going to be more warming in temperature, but we have to be careful here because the, the Chinese colors and the English colors are different. That in Chinese, there's green tea, which is green tea. There's oolong tea, which means dark dragon. So that's what they call black tea. And then there's something called red tea. And that gets confusing sometimes because what we call black tea, Chinese people call red tea. And people get confused because a lot of times people think red tea, oh, that means rooibos tea, which rooibos tea is not tea, it's an herb. So um, 
so they would say, so if you said black tea, you would think like oolong. And if they said hong cha, that means like what we call black tea, like an English breakfast tea. So there the temperature is going to depend on what, what type of tea that um, green tea is going to be more cooling. Whereas um, oolong tea or black tea is going to be more warming and probably more drying. Um, but I don't know. And so, so that's something you can kind of, you can choose one based on your constitution. If you're more, um, if you, if you have a warm constitution versus a cold constitution, you can also change it according to the season. So if you're like, if it's summer and it's really hot, drink green tea. If it's winter and it's really cold, drink oolong tea or things like that. So, um, so you can kind of, you can kind of pick and choose there. And then I also like, I just like tea because, um, I mean, I do drink a lot of coffee, but ideally I would drink more tea because tea also has, uh, that amino acid L-theanine in it. So it's on the one hand, the coffee is a stimulant, but the L-theanine, uh, like helps you calm down and be more focused. Um, so I think really tea is better. Also, I will notice that, um, I'm not sure if I said this before, but like sometimes I make the statement that like people always ask me like do you take herbs and it's like I actually don't notice much of an effect with most herb with most herbal formulas like sometimes I'll take a formula because I know it's good for me but I don't actually notice much of an effect I notice a much larger effect of with basically I have a crappy diet and so I much I notice a much larger effect when I change my diet versus when I uh, take herbs but I do notice a difference taking tea and I would say I definitely notice a difference between a uh, tea that comes in a bag and loose leaf tea that when I get actual loose leaf tea and put it in a strainer and and cook it that way I notice an effect whereas if I just uh, use a tea bag from the supermarket then I don't notice much effect um, but I do feel like like when I like get some like loose leaf uh usually do like oolong tea like a uh, alishan oolong tea if I get something like that then I do notice the fact that like I do feel calmer and more focused because I think because of the L-theanine but I also notice like it's moving things through my spleen it's draining dampness it's doing things that it should and so actually I notice more effect from drinking oolong tea than I do from taking Liu Jun Zetong or Ping Wei San or something like that so I think tea is a good idea. I think there's also this saying um, that Warren Shear in his uh, in his cookbook he quotes a saying that like if somebody is sick you first change their diet. If that doesn't work, then you give them tea, and if that doesn't work, then you give them acupuncture and herbs. So I think tea is a good thing to do. Poo -poo 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 -poo. If you have heat, what caffeinated tea would be good for you? Um, so things that are more green rather than black. So green, like green teas are going to be more cooling. And then think about what is like, if you're just like getting stuff at the, at the supermarket, think about it's usually mixed with something. So I'd say if you're worried about if you have heat, then I would think about either a, like a green tea, just green tea. Um, what's the dragon tea I'm thinking of? I was about to say Xiaoqing Long Tong, and that's not what I'm thinking of. Um, there's the green dragon tea. Anyway, green tea, or think about what it's mixed with. It's like very common to get like green tea mixed with mint or something like that. That's something that's cooling versus if you get green tea mixed with ginger, then it might be warm or it could be that the two temperatures cancel themselves out. So if you have an upset stomach, green tea with ginger could be very good. But if you're trying to get rid of the heat, maybe don't get the one with ginger in it. So, and I feel like lately, like last time I was there, I got, um, it was kind of nice that they had some some teas that was like a mixture of like tea ginger and then also had orange peel in it i assume just for the taste but it's like oh we're like we're like halfway there to our chentong so so you can think about what the tea is mixed with as well um but in general but also in general i'd say your general diet might have more of an effect of versus what tea that you tea that you drink so think about what's going on with your diet and then also think about like like 
still be gentle, don't do too much. Like sometimes people are like, oh, I have spleen cold, I should have ginger. And they start putting ginger in everything. They're like, I'm gonna drink ginger tea, I'm gonna eat ginger candies, I'm gonna put all this ginger in my stir fry and in my soup. And they actually go overboard in the other direction. So I would think about that too. Boop, 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 boop. We're getting to an hour. I'm starting to, I can tell my voice is getting scratchy. Point location videos are incredibly helpful to help us limit what we learn. Yeah, and, and I think that's good. It, it, I'm like, like I think that's the thing I get a lot is that um, it's kind of like if you learn it once in class, and it's nice to be able to go home and have a review. And so, like for that purpose, I like it. The thing I worry about is non-acupuncturists watching it and thinking they can do acupuncture. The other option is that I believe there's a Deadman app. If you're if you go to the app store, I believe there's a Deadman app, and it's like it's it's expensive. It's like forty bucks, but I believe he does have point location videos for each point on there. So that's another option if you want to just get the Deadman app. I think he has um, he has videos for all the location stuff. I was gonna say somebody made a really good point lo um, point location website, and I can't remember the name of it now. Um, cause he got, cause he got stuff like this, and this is just like very generic. You can't like this is just like what you would find in your textbook. But um, somebody else made a website where it's actually like located on a real person. And I can't remember, oh, there's my videos, great. I'm like one of the first things that comes up for acupuncture point location. Anyway, somebody made, somebody made a really good website that had, um, not that. They had it, it. It wasn't. It wasn't just drawings. It was like they had uh, pictures. It was like a photograph of a person, and then they drew on the bony, the bony landmarks that you were palpating for. And it was. It was, it was they had really good pictures, and it was a picture of an actual person, not just a diagram. So, I remember finding that once before, and I can't find it now. But anyway, I think I'm gonna say that's it for today. Thanks for being here. I hope my audio is okay. I was I need to might need to readjust my microphone again. So I'll take a look at that, make sure my gain was set at the right level. Um tomorrow we're doing uh uh we're doing more herbs. We're doing herbs that relieve coughing and wheezing. So that's gonna be tomorrow. So basically the 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 schedule for this uh, semester is we're going to go through all the categories for herbology too. So we already have something up for herbs that dispel wind dampness. We had herbs. So last week we did herbs that transform cold phlegm. So that's what we did last week. And so this week we're going to go over herbs that relieve coughing and wheezing. So this is actually not a very exciting category. It's like all these herbs like, yeah, they, they're, they're good for coughing and wheezing. Shingren, Good for coughing and wheezing. Kwan Dong Hua, good for coughing. Zutsuza, good for cough. So it's it's not a very exciting one, but that's what we'll do tomorrow. And then we'll have the that whole um, transform phlegm and stop cough thing done. So that's what we're doing uh, tomorrow, 10 a.m. Pacific. If you're into herbs, we'll see you there. Sarah, what what question did you ask? Sorry, I lost your question. Oh, here. Can I have an online clinic and diagnose my clients online or should it be in person? I think it's going to be easier in person. Um, so this is something that some people do once once COVID happened. They started doing online things where they would do Zoom appointments. Like you could see people online. You can ask them questions. You could look at their tongue and stuff like that. And that's okay. I suppose you can... You can still hear their voice and things like that, but um, at least for me and the way I do acupuncture, it's like I like to be able to see a person, see how they walk, hear their voice, palpate things. It's going to be very hard if you can't palpate them and things like that. So I think it can be done and this kind of... Um, 
And I guess this does kind of get back into historical things of like how was how was acupuncture practiced historically, where where when you had court physicians, maybe they couldn't see their patients or touch their patients. There's these stories about um, if you were treating uh, one of the emperor's wives, then you the the doctor couldn't actually see or touch them, so they would wrap a string around their wrist and stick it out the window, and the doctor would have to um, diagnose the pulse based on looking at a string wrapped around someone's wrist. He was not allowed to actually touch them. And so that might work, especially if you're doing herbs. People will say that tongue diagnosis is more important for herbs, whereas pulse diagnosis is more important for acupuncture. So if you're just doing herbs, maybe that's a possibility that you could talk to someone, get their symptoms, look at their tongue, and recommend an herbal formula, and then just ship the herbal formula to them or, or something like that. So it's a possibility. For me, it would not be ideal. But I, I know people did it out of necessity when uh, COVID happened and everything was shut down. So I know that people did it. To me, it would not be ideal. Um, I know even some people did it with like ear seed stuff where they would diagnose a person online and then they would walk through how to apply your ear seeds so a person could do ear seeds on themselves or do acu or acupressure on themselves or things like that. So it's possible, but in my mind, it would not be ideal. I I prefer to touch people. So it's up to you. It's possible. I Like I said, I guess I'm just repeating myself. It's possible. I would think it's not ideal though. I think that's it. I'm going to go release my cat and get on with my life. Thank you for being here. Have a good week. It's, yeah, today's Friday. Have a good weekend. We'll see you next time. <sighs> the cat is very quiet. I hope he's still okay in there. Because he was running around this morning. Okay, I'm going to go look at the cat. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time.